Hallelujah. What an evening. We bring you this evening service on the 6th of February from the city of Palakkad. The world is going through such an awesome time. It's a very, very difficult and challenging times. At the same time, people of God are going through an awesome time as well. They are uh, doing awesome work for the, for the Lord. This evening I heard a beautiful message uh, and, and a beautiful uh, you know, word of God uh, from, from Bombay. But during these challenging times, Satan is very active and he wants to go after the weak people. He is searching for the weak people to attack. And more than any time, such as now, the Lord is our refuge and our fortress. And whoever delves in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty God. I'm quoting this from Psalm 91. This evening, I would like to start the, the evening service. I'm taking two Proverbs. Proverbs 16, 18 and Proverbs 13, 10. Why I've taken the two of them? The two of them concern pride, the issue of pride, which is there in the heart of people, most people. The verse 13.10 says, pride leads to conflict and those who take advice are wise. Proverbs 16.18 says, Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. Now let me spend a few minutes talking about this pride issue. You'll see that most times there is not a single quarrel among individuals, whether be it in private life or be it in, uh, for that matter, even nations, for example. They go to war and all of it proceeds from pride or ambition. People go to war, people quarrel among themselves. Jesus, it was to destroy the spirit of pride that Jesus manifested in the extreme humility when he came onto this earth. He was a person of extreme humility because he wanted to show it to people. The salvation of Christ is a deliverance from pride among other things. And he clothed himself with humility. And as, as long as we are humble, we are saved. And that's our portion. But we need to be humble in all areas of our life. Jesus came not only to, to die for your sins, he also came to solve your issues, to help you with your issues, your problems rather. God offers you a new life in Christ. And with this power, you can change whatever the situation you are in. You can change if you belong to Christ and you, you always pray and you, you come to him. Are you a proud person? Can I ask that question? Do you struggle with, the, with pride as an issue? Now, mind you, the question I'm asking is a trick question. So you've got to be very careful when you answer me on that. Yeah, because there is an irony that with pride, a person always thinks, a person who is very proud, he always thinks he is the most humble person. And the humble person thinks that he is very proud. You always find this situation. And you can say that modesty is, not, is one of my best qualities. You keep on you know, boasting about it. I'm a very modest guy, you know. I don't show off and all that like the others. You'll find fault with the others. But did you know that when there was a survey taken of a variety of, of, of surveys for checking out how people consider themselves, when they asked the question, are you a proud person? Are you modest in your, in your life and how you deal with others? As high as 90%, of those who responded to the survey 
taught themselves above average in the area of pride and modesty. They always thought, you know, we, we are not a guy with so much pride. No, I'm not talking about the problem of pride per se. It's a big issue, a big issue for people. But people just forget about it. People think there is no need to think, you know, as long as God has uh, blessed me or, or some people who don't even think about God think that they have all the money in the world. They have all the uh, creature comforts and they, did not, they didn't, uh, don't have to think uh, anything about it. But let me tell you, it's a big one for both Christians and non-Christians as well. Because every stage of your life, of our, of our Christian life and development, and every area of our dis Christian discipleship, pride is, pride is the greatest issue, and humility your greatest friend. That's, just, that's uh, what pride is all about. The problem of pride, let me tell you, God won, God hates pride. Proverbs 16, 5. And the other way, the, the other way is pride hates God. It's a two-way round situation. God hates pride, pride hates God. Now I'm not saying this from, from my own making. Pride hates God is from Psalm uh, 10, verse 4. Not only God hates pride, pride hates God. The time, Psalm 10, 10 verse 4 says, In his pride, the wicked does not ask him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. That's what Psalm 10 says. Now I want to ask you today, how do you as a Christian dress up? I'm not talking in the worldly sense you might be thinking of I'm thinking of how God cares about what you wear so much so that he <clears throat> so much so he directly tells you in the scriptures clothe yourself with humility 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 5 conversely when we wear that pride we are opposing ourselves to create a God of the heavens and the earth. Wearing pride leads to anxiety, sin, and even death at times. In contrast, in the contrast to that of pride is humility. The benefits of wearing humility is overwhelming. So the question you need to ask today to yourself is, what are you wearing? Are you wearing pride? Or are you wearing humility? Please think about it. It's a beautiful proverb. There's a lot of meaning, a lot of insight to it. Because God really is looking for humble people, people with humility. And that's what the two, two uh, proverbs which I have talked about brings out this very clearly. So church, let's have our time of worship. As the worship team sings, I pray that uh, the songs and, and the worship songs will, will be acceptable to the Lord and will bring glory to his name. Welcome the, the worship team. Please come. Jesus. Thank you, Father, that you're here in our midst, moving powerfully. You're here in our midst, moving, Lord, with all of your might, all of your power, all of your glory. Yes, Lord, unleash your power. Let your glory be revealed unto your sons and your daughters. For you are the King of glory. You are the Prince of peace. You are the joy of our hearts. Yes, Lord, you are the joy of our homes, Lord. You are the joy of our lives, Lord. So we welcome you, O King of kings and Lord of lords. We welcome you in our midst. 
O King of glory, we welcome you. Be thou lifted on high, be thou exalted. We give you the highest praise. It belongs to you. It belongs to you, Jesus. Breathe.
for your amazing grace, Lord, because you are the one who breaks the power of sin and darkness. You are the one whose love is mighty and so much stronger. You are our King of kings. You are the King of glory. And you're welcome in our midst, Lord. We welcome you.
King of kings and Lord of lords Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Declare! Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Declare! Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Declare over your life, declare over your home, declare over your children, declare over your business. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? strong and victorious in battle so if he is for us nothing can be against us nothing can stop his plans and purposes to be accomplished in our lives none can stop none can stop because he is our God and he is beautiful and wonderful he his nature is lovely He's all-powerful, all-knowing. Let's worship this magnificent Savior, the King of glory, which is in our midst.
over there will need no sun or moon to shine on it because the glory of God will illuminate the city, will light up the city. He is the light in the new city. The Lamb is its light. You're omniscient, Lord. You're all powerful. And your glory fills the earth, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord, you are the light in the darkness. You are the light, Lord Jesus. You are that bright morning star, Lord. Yes, Lord, your nature is amazing and loving, Lord Jesus. Lord, we stand in awe of you because you are so good. We will sing because you are good and a love and news forever, Lord. You are that glorious light, Lord, that is leading us, that is leading us, Lord. Yes, Lord Jesus, cause your people to take dominion, to take dominion, Lord, to march on, to march on boldly and courageously with all of your strength, all of your power and all of your might because you are the light in the darkness. You are the light leading your people. It might be dark, Lord, still. Yet though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because you are with me. And if you are with me, why should I be afraid? Why should I be fearful? Because our God is with us, who will hold our hand and will lead us to his glorious light. We are no longer slaves to fear, but we are the children of the living one. Because we have a good, good Father who cares for us, who loves us. His love for us is never ending, never failing. His love will never fail you. He will never fail you. You're a good, good Father. It's who you are.
your kingdom come let your glory be revealed let heaven come into our lives let heaven invade powerfully in our lives in our home in our churches at our workplaces let heaven come let heaven invade let heaven invade let his glory be revealed among the nations Come, Holy Spirit, we magnify you, we glorify you. Do what you have promised to do. Do, Lord, do your work, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, we live for your glory. Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom be established in our midst, Lord. In the homes of our friends and families, Lord, let your kingdom be established, Lord. In those places where you are being dethroned, Lord, we put you back on the throne. We are putting you back on the throne, Lord. Come, be established. Let your throne be established on the praises of your people. Bring back, bring back the cross. Bring back the king of glory in your homes. Bring back the king of life, the king of eternal life. For we cannot live without him. We cannot have anything without him. We cannot do, cannot function without him. Yes, Lord, we bring you back, Lord Jesus. We look to you, we look to you. Let heaven come and invade our hearts. Let your glory be revealed, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Speak to us, Lord. We come at the rest of the time into your mighty hands. That your Holy Spirit will lead us, Lord, and will speak to us. We open our hearts to receive your word this evening. Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom be established. Let your kingdom advance. Lord, powerfully, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening, viewers. This evening, I'm going to be speaking to you about a topic that I believe can change our lives, can change your lives. And I've titled my message, Walking in the Miraculous. We need to understand that when I speak about walking in the miraculous, I'm talking about walking in the supernatural. When Jesus walked the earth, he walked in the supernatural. He was naturally supernatural and it is his desire that his people walk the same way that he walked the earth. You may ask me the question, is it possible to walk the way Jesus walked. Because Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. And you may turn around and ask me, is it possible for me to walk that way? You need to understand that you are born of the Spirit of God. The day you ask Jesus to just walk into your life, he comes in and takes residence in your life and he, he completely transforms you and, he, and his spirit is connected with your spirit so that you can live the way that he lived. But very often we do not believe that. We do not believe that we can walk the way that he walked. And because of that, we live below the bar and we shortchange ourselves in our journey here on earth. And we walk in a very, very limited fashion. Because we walk in our own strength, we walk in our own abilities, we walk in our own intelligence, and we do not harness our life to the power of the Holy Ghost, the way God meant us to harness our lives. 
And this evening, we are just going to look at the different things that actually come and, and take control of our lives and swamp us and keep us from moving forward or living to the full potential that God planned when he made you. Before I go there, I want to read to you from a passage of scripture from the gospel of Mark chapter 16. Verses 15 to 18. The words of Jesus to the disciples. He says, and then he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Then he goes on to say in verse 17, these miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name and they will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety and they will drink anything poisonous. It won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. God wanted us to bring heaven down. Just like the, our worship team sang this evening. Let heaven come down. God wants heaven to come and invade earth. And he wants the power of heaven to propel your life. But very often that doesn't happen. We just think that okay these, these so called uh, things that God, Jesus spoke to the disciples were just for the disciples and his apostles, not for us today. But this word is for his church, for the ecclesia, for you and me. That we will walk in a way that when people look at us, they will be amazed and they will know that we do not live like how they live because they are limited. But we can live by the limitless power of Almighty God. Very often, we are swamped, our minds are swamped, and we are invaded by the world. Our opinions are the things of the world. Our models are the people of this world. Our standards are the, are the standards of this world. We do not live by the standards of God. By, by kingdom principles. And the reason we do that is because one, we do not know God the way we really need to know him. Like I say many times, we do not know his word. We have no revelation or understanding of who God is. And this word that we have, this Bible is more like a talisman that we carry around here and there. But we do not open that word and look into that word and know what is written in that word. And our lives is, are not governed by that word and we do not practice the word. That is why Jesus said that a man who, who does not practice the word is like a man who builds his house upon, a, upon sand and not rock. He says a man who practices the word is like one who builds his house on a rock. No matter what could be the storms of life, his house will stand strong. His life will stand strong. But a man who just lives and who does not put this word into practice is like a man who builds his house on the sand. When the storms of life come, he comes crashing down. He fails. He gives up. And he's an, he's a, he's an absolute uh, disaster. Life becomes a disaster for him. 
But a man who knows the word of God and lives by that word and practices that word is the man who can actually stand no matter what storm comes in his life. And very often, there are a few things that we do not do. One is that we do not know the word and, the, and, the, and there's no revelation when we read the word. There's no understanding of the word. We don't practice the word. Number two, our lives are prayerless. The sin of prayerlessness. No time to seek God or to ask God or to seek his counsel or to inquire of him or ask for his help. We live without, a, without connectivity. And we are not able to move with the power that could have been ours if we were connected to God in prayer. The third reason is there's no passion, no love for God, no passion for Him, no passion for the kingdom. And we do not know His heart. And we do not know what are His plans for us. And because of which, we stumble through life. And the fourth thing is that we are totally, we live totally independent of God. Independent of his power and strength. We do not live under his lordship. Very often we don't even acknowledge him. Maybe we, we land up in church, we go to church. But we are just hearers of the word, not doers of the word. And that is where we fail. And we think that we are wise. Romans chapter 1 verses 21 to 22 is, yes, they knew God. But they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, of result their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be God, blaming, claiming to be wise, they became utter fools. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says that, That many of the many people, and I'm talking here about believers, they have their own ideas of who God really is, because of which their minds are dark and confused. And many of them think they're wise, but end up making utter fools of themselves because they choose to live independent of God. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 3 says, Even an ox knows its owner, and a donkey recognizes its master's care. But Israel doesn't know its master. My people don't recognize my care for them. Here it's God speaking to his people. He says, even an animal will know who's, who its master is. But very often my people don't know who their master is. How true, how many of us live independent of God who do not submit to his lordship? Who live according to the devices of their own heart and the imaginations of their own mind? Not by the counsel of the Lord or by the, in the ways of the Lord. Because of which they lose out on God's great plan and destiny for their lives. You may ask me, does God really have a plan? But the word of God says, he wrote every day in his book before one came to be. So even before you were born, even, from, even before the foundations of the earth, in his book, he wrote every single day, every single hour, minute of your life for you. 
even before you were born, before you even you entered this world. And you may ask and wonder sometimes why is it that my life is a mess even though God wrote it? Did God write out a mess for me? No. God never planned your life to be messed up. God never planned your life to be a, a mass of confusion. Because God is a God not of, not of order and not of chaos. <coughs> Jeremiah chapter 21, 21 verse 11 to 14 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and will bring you home again to your own land. This is God speaking to the nation of Israel. And it is his word for you and me today. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forevermore. It's not something that is only in the past. Where God is not there anymore or God is there only for the Israelites. He's not there for us anymore or that the Bible has become obsolete. No, it is relevant even today. It says, for I know the plans I have for you. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And yet many times we are stuck in the wrong jobs. Many of us are doing things that we don't like doing. Many of us were educated to do some particular, uh, like have a particular vocation, but you ended up doing something else which you don't like because you need the money. And living in ruts, being, un being dissatisfied, unhappy, and wondering where God is and why your life is so miserable. The answer is here. I'll give you all the answers from these, these verses. Sometimes you may wonder, why am I in captivity? But the answer the Lord says in verse 12, if you pray, I will listen. If you pray, I will listen. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. Many times you're in captivity because of your car loans, your house loans, things that are crushing you, difficult financial situations that you may be in, the wrong decisions that you made, which maybe married, married the wrong person in a hurry, never inquired of the Lord, because of which today your marriage is a living hell. And very often we very very conveniently shift the blame onto God. Because many times it's our own decisions, our wrong decisions that put us in captivity. But there is hope. There's hope, my friend. He says, I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. And if you are in, a, in the wrong place, where you are unhappy and dissatisfied and miserable, God says, I will change that. But there's a rider to that. And it says that if you will seek me, if you will seek me and cry out to me with all your heart, I will be found by you. If you pray, I will listen. God shows us the way to get out of your mess.
because god wants you to walk in a way that is worthy of his name because you are his child you bear his name you are part of his family and he cannot have messed up failures he wants you he wants good success to be your portion he wants you to be like a city on a hill that nobody can look past or ignore this evening i want to talk to you about one such person whose life was totally devoted to god and whose life was led 100% by god and every decision that this person made was made keeping putting and putting god first in his life setting god before all above and before all else and this person that i'm going to be talking to you about is daniel in ezekiel god makes mention of him ezekiel chapter 14 verse 14 says even if noah daniel and job were there their righteousness would save no one but themselves says the sovereign lord so god put daniel along with noah and job and called him righteous and this righteous man ate the fruit of his righteousness because today very often we are eating the fruit of our our misdemeanors we are eating the fruit of our foolishness we are eating the fruit of of uh, our uh, sinfulness and we are in despair and our life is a disaster and we are wondering where is god god is very much there if you care to call on his name and inquire of him and seek him with all your heart he will come and take you out of your prison bars out of your captivity out of your shame out of your poverty because only god can do that daniel was a young boy maybe a preteen or early teens 13 or 14 years when he was taken as an exile into babylon by king nebuchadnezzar snatch away snatched away from his parents from the land that he was growing up in and taken into the court of king nebuchadnezzar to serve him in a pagan situation in a land where he could not where the god of the hebrews was forgotten yahweh was nowhere there in the courts of babylon but in there in daniel chapter 1 verse 8 it tells us that daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the polluted foods and the wine that was served at the king's table as a person working in the king's court he could eat just about anything he wanted he could enjoy himself in the court but he decided as a young boy as a teenager that he will not defile himself he purposed it in his heart and then you see a long story of him meeting with success after success and god prospering him god lifting him up and god being with him and causing him to walk in the miraculous that made king nebuchadnezzar because he served under four kings and made all each and every king whether it was nebuchadnezzar or whether it was cyrus or whether it was belshazzar whoever he served under darius all those kings were amazed 
and they vouched for the God of Daniel. They said the God of Daniel is truly God. Because God was so inundated in his life, he was so full of God. And God propelled Daniel's life forward and was with him in every situation and caused Daniel to be always above and never beneath. That kings were amazed and shocked when they saw the things that happened in Daniel's life. There was a time God spoke to Daniel through dreams and visions. God walked closely with Daniel. In the book of Daniel chapter 6 verse 3 we, we are told that Daniel prayed three times a day. Turned his face towards Jerusalem. Opened out his window and turned towards Jerusalem and prayed three times a day. He sought the living God. And God was evident in Daniel's life. There was a time when Nebuchadnezzar saw a dream. And he called the enchanters and the magicians in his court and he said, Tell me what did I dream? People were totally foxed and amazed. And he said, what kind of a demand is that? He said, I'll, I'll have your heads chopped off you, if you don't tell me what I dream, what I dreamt. People were saying, how can we tell him what he dreamt? And the enchanters told him, they said, king, tell us what you dreamt. Then we will interpret it for you. He said, no. King Nebuchadnezzar said, you must tell me what I dreamt and give me the, the interpretation to that dream. I'm reading from the chapter, uh, from Daniel chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. The astrologers replied to the king, no one on earth can tell the king his dream. And no king, however great and powerful, has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter or astrologer. The king's demand is impossible. No one except the gods can tell you your dream. And they do not live here among people. These were the wise men of his court. And they said there's no way, there's nobody here on earth who can tell you king what you dreamt. And there's been no king ever who, who's asked for such an impossible request. Something that, that man cannot ever accomplish. And verse 16 to 19 tells us, Daniel went at once to see the king and requested more time to tell the king what the dream meant. He said, king, give me time. I'll tell you what this dream, what you dreamt. And then Daniel went home and told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah what had happened. He urged them to ask the God of heaven to show them his mercy by telling them the secret so that they would not be executed along with the other wise men of Babylon. That night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. So here, it says that Daniel asked the king for some more time because the king had said that he's going to execute everybody if they did not come and tell him what he had dreamt. And Daniel with his three friends who were also Hebrews, who also worshipped the God of Israel, who loved the God of Israel, they prayed because they knew that God was the source of everything. That God was their strong deliverer, God was their counselor, God was their strength in this pagan land, with this pagan king. And you must understand that they were just teenagers. And verse 19 says, that night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. 
Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. And verse 26 to 28 says, The king said to Daniel, Is this true? Can you tell me what my dream was and what it means? So two demands. One, he has to come up with what he had dreamt. And second, he had to interpret the dream. Daniel replied, There are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. But there is a God in heaven who reveals the secrets and he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. So there was Daniel who came and told him that I will tell you what you dreamt and what it means because ordinary mortals cannot tell you but there is a God in heaven. And that God was Daniel's God, who had revealed the secret to Daniel, who had come in the time of their distress and saved these young men from execution and had revealed to them the great secret. And along that, along the way, along the way had also raised them up in the eyes of the king. And then Daniel tells the king what he had dreamt and he interprets the dream. And when he does that, verse 26, the king said to Daniel, sorry, uh, in, in, in verse 47 to 48, after Daniel tells the king his dream and the interpretation of the dream and things to come and what it really meant, you must go and read it. It says that the king said to Daniel, truly your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal the secret. Then the king appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. He made Daniel ruler over the whole province of Babylon as well as a chief over all his wise men. And that is what God wants to do in your life and in my life. He wants to be very much part of our lives. In every situation, he wishes for us to turn to him for counsel, turn to him for strength, turn to him for, for help. Because God wants to be evident in your life. He wants to be visible. Just like God was so visible before the king, before King Nebuchadnezzar. The same way God wants you to showcase him to this world. Because you are, you and I are his ambassadors. We are the ones who need to represent him before a dying world, before a, a world that doesn't know him. And verse 48 tells us, not only is God glorified, but Daniel also is raised up and is blessed with many valuable gifts and is made the ruler over everybody else. And a similar situation happens again. It's in the fourth chapter of Daniel where King Nebuchadnezzar again sees a dream. And after it, he dreams. And Daniel interprets that dream for King Nebuchadnezzar. There's another situation where Nebuchadnezzar sends out a message to the people of his country, not just in his court, 
but also in his country. And he says in verse 2, uh, sorry, uh, yes, in verse 2 of Daniel, it says, I want, uh, Daniel chapter 4, verse 2, it says, I want you all to know that the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. He tells every one of his subjects about this great God of Israel. Verse 3 says, how great are his signs, how powerful his wonders, his kingdom will last forever, his rule through all generations. Who is talking and saying these things? An unbelieving pagan king who has tasted and seen the power of the living God. Because Daniel chose to stand with God and God was with Daniel and God prospered Daniel in all his ways and Daniel lives under these kings, Nebuchadnezzar, and then uh, Belshazzar, and Darius, and every time, and wherever he is, he's successful. Walking in the miraculous, moving with God by his side, doing astonishing things before kings, before people. And God received great honor. Because Daniel was a life that was, which was totally, solely dependent on God. He was totally devoted to God in every way. I'm just going to be reading from Daniel chapter 6 verse 1 to 5. Darius the Mede, he decides now to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces. And he has officials to rule over the province. The king chose Daniel and two others to rule. And Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the administrators and, and high officers because of, God, of Daniel's great ability. The king made plans to place him over the entire empire. In another translation it says, because Daniel had a spirit of excellence. Because of which the king wanted to make him the ruler over the entire, over all the satraps. And the people who were with Daniel started getting jealous. And they said that we need to find some way that we can pull Daniel down. Verse 4 says, then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs. But they couldn't find any, anything to criticize or condemn him. He was faithful, always responsible and completely trustworthy. Something that we can learn from Daniel. That we as his people, as, as God's people, as believers, wherever we work, whatever we do, that we work with the spirit of excellence, that people who, who are with us will find us faithful, responsible, completely trustworthy. That's the way we need to live. And they wanted to find a way to, to uh, get at Daniel. And they, and, and they plan and they put up a huge statue of Darius, the king, and they say that everyone for 30 days have to bow down to this statue. Because they knew that they couldn't trap Daniel any other way except with his God. Daniel verse six, verse seven, uh, chapter 6 verse 7 says, Give orders that for the next 30 days any person who prays to anyone divine or human except to you your majesty will be thrown into the den of lions so they said there they were making a snare for Daniel's feet they said anyone who prays to any other god or a human being for 30 days should be put into 
a den of lions. And we all know the story of, the, the, of Daniel thrown into the den of lions because, because the, the, in, uh, in the book of Daniel chapter 6 verse 10 says, but always take note of the ifs and the buts in the Bible. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, the law that he had to bow down to this statue of the king, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with his windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. So Daniel was fearless. He did not consider his life precious and, and, and he did not go and bow down to, to this idol or turn away from the God of heaven and earth, the living God, Yahweh. When the order of, at that time of, for, the, for the Medes had to be signed, anything that was signed and stamped by the signet ring of the king was irrevocable. There was no way out. And yet, knowing that Daniel goes and kneels before the, before the God of heaven and turns his face towards Jerusalem. Because he is ready even to die. But he will not bow his head to any other God. Resolute, devoted, passionate about his God. Trusting God no matter how the situation is. Not making any contingency plans like many of us would have done. Trying to find a way out. Trying to compromise in order to save our neck. Daniel did not do that. Daniel was ready he, to put his neck on the block. But he, would, he decided that he would not bow to any other God but to Yahweh. And it says, I love this. It says, he prayed three times a day. Just as he, just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. And verse 10 says, says, but when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, what did he do? He did not run away. He did not hide. He went home, knelt down as he usually did in his upstairs room with his windows open towards Jerusalem. And then we all know because we have sung these songs, in Sunday school about how Daniel was thrown into the lion's den and an angel of the Lord came and shut the mouth of the lions and early in the morning the king comes and says Daniel did your God save you and Daniel says my king the God of heaven has saved your servant and verse 24 and 28 of the same chapter of 6 of 6 of 6 chapter of Daniel says then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel he had them thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children the lion leaped on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den then king Darius sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world because Babylon at that time had a huge uh, kingdom several kingdoms that they had um, th that they had uh, that had become part of their nation because of the military strength it says the letter says peace and prosperity to you I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel, again, a right decision made by a, by a right man brought about the right outcome. Where the nations, here we have Darius who's sending it to every race and nation in the whole world. And he says, I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. For he is a living God and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. 
So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So we have the testimony coming out of a, of a king, who, an unbelieving king, a king who worshipped idols, a pagan king, says that everyone should tremble before the God of Daniel. And why did that happen? That happened because Daniel decided not to compromise. He, he chose de death to com over compromise. He said, I would rather die than compromise my faith and turn my back upon my God. And God came through for Daniel. If only more people would stand uncompromising, would stand in faith, would stand in, in, in being trustworthy, would stand deciding that they are not going to turn to the left or to the right but they would follow hard after their God they would see the same miracles in their lives that Daniel saw in his life but very often we shortchange ourselves Daniel knew that God was his lifeline and today, I urge you, and, I, and I'm telling myself as well, because this is a lesson to all of us, that we need to work, walk worthy of our salvation. That we need to follow after God with, I mean, wholeheartedly. But very often our hearts are divided. That is the reason Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. Because he will love one and hate the other. And many times we want to have, hold God on one hand and hold the world with the other. And then wonder why God is not showing up. God cannot show up where there is lukewarm people. In the book of Revelations we are told that, the, the, I mean the very words of God. The sovereign God, he says, be either hot or cold. Don't be lukewarm because then I will spit you out of my mouth. I'll vomit you out of my mouth. He wants people who are totally devoted to him, fearless, uncompromising, standing for the truth, standing in the integrity of their heart, purposing in their heart that they will not defile themselves. Just like how Daniel purposed. And he said, I'm not going to defile myself. This was a decision of a young teenager. And God honored him. And he was there in the courts of the kings. He was there in the rule of four kings. And every time he came on top, every time the I mean, kings took notice of him and his God. And they testified about the God of Daniel because God showed up in Daniel's life. And today, this is a call for you and me to, to dare to walk this way. That we can walk in the miraculous. That God can come and, and just invade and pervade our lives. That his power and glory and splendor and majesty will just pour out of our lives. That nobody, that there will be no place for any discussion or arguments. That everybody around us will cry out and say that the God of Israel is God. But today God is not able to be God in your life. Because you have not put him on the throne of your life. He doesn't have lordship over your life. Your decisions are based on the world system. Your decisions are not based on the word of God or, 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 or on the counsel of the, of the Almighty. And that is the reason that people fail. If you are failing, stop and ask yourself. Are you the wrong person in the wrong job? Living in captivity to loans and debts, EMIs you cannot pay, in difficult situations, inundated with trouble. Time to take stock. 
Introspect, where does God figure out in your life? Does he have lordship over your life? Is he ruling on the throne of your heart? Does he have you? Does he have your devotion? Does he have your attention? Are you dependent on on God or are you, or do you live a life independent of God today and say that it is common sense? I need to use I need to use my head. The book of Proverbs we are told Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Your paths will be directed. Your ways will be directed. You will be prosperous in your way. When Joshua took over the nation of Israel and he was put in command after Moses. And he had to take this great nation fight battles, get into the promised land, give every tribe their allotted portion. He had to fight with kings. And when he was overwhelmed, the Lord said, do not fear. I am with you. Meditate upon this law, upon this book, day and night, and you will have good success. God didn't say be trained or do this or do that or learn better military skills or arrange the, the army in a particular way or do or, or, or give him any other advice. He says meditate on this law day and night. Let it not depart from your mouth. Let it be in your heart. Let it be in your mouth. Then you will be successful and your paths will be made straight. Even today it is the same God who looks at you and tells you lean on me cry out to me be devoted to me do not compromise do not turn to the left or to the right do not learn from the, from the people or the things of this world but follow hard after me and then you will have good success then you will see the glory of God. God does not want us to build our lives on the patterns of this world. But he wants our mind to be transformed so that we will know what his will for our lives are. His good, perfect and pleasing will and his great purposes for you will come to pass. I want to finish with this verse from Daniel chapter 11 verse 32. It says those who know their God will do great exploits. So if you know your God, you will do great exploits. You will walk in the miraculous. You will always be above, never beneath. And people around you will cry out and will testify and say that the God of Israel is truly God. So let us purpose in our hearts that we will not defile ourselves with, this, with the things of this fleeting world. But let's keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And let us live by a different beat. That is the beat of heaven. And then his kingdom will come down into our lives. And we will see his glory and his goodness pass before our very eyes. May the Lord bless you and bless this word. And may it bring forth, bring forth a mighty harvest in your life. Who heard the word and me who preached. God bless you. I invite the higher and the worship team to lead us. In the, in the last song.
Praise God. That was an awesome time of, of word and a beautiful song, the last song. We are the children of, of God, the God of the miracle. It doesn't matter what your situation is, your current situation is. When you cry out to God, He will answer. And your life, you will lack no good thing. Your life will be a life of abundance in every area. Because our God is a God of miracles. Let me give the benediction and close. May the God of peace, who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, strengthen your inner being for every good work. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you this day and forevermore. And all the saints of God said, Amen, Amen. God bless you. See you next week again at the same time, next Saturday at 7 p.m. We'll have a time of worship and the sharing of the word. And uh, have a good week ahead. May you go through the word again because it is an awesome word which is preached this evening. And I'm sure your lives will change, will be blessed by the world. Thank you and good night.